I'm joined by my colleague Adrian Dix, the Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer, as well as Dr. Penny Ballum, the Immunization and Response Team Coordinator. At the start, I want to thank all three of these individuals for the extraordinary work they've been doing, not just over the past couple of weeks or the past couple of months, but indeed over the past year to keep British Columbians safe and focusing on the things that matter most to British Columbians. You'll recall that in late January, we were the first province in the country to announce our COVID-19 vaccination plan. Our plan was to give pe get people immunized as quickly as we could by focusing on those that were most at risk. The most severely ill that we've seen over the past uh, number of months have been those who are in their latter years and those that have comorbidities. So our focus has been on not just those that are most susceptible, but indeed those that are most vulnerable and the people who care for them. And I want to say that it's been an extraordinary number of weeks where we've seen 275,000 people vaccinated here in British Columbia, focusing on long-term care residents and staff, people in rural and remote Indigenous communities, as well as health care workers that focus on COVID-19 patients. That's tremendous success based on the amount of vaccine we've had available to us. And we're very excited today to announce we're moving in to phase two of our vaccination plan. Although we already have about 90% of the residents in long-term care facilities and the staff immunized, we will continue to go back to those first stages and Dr. Henry will lay out how we're gonna do that in a few moments. But today as we start phase two, this will include, of course, seniors 80 years and better, or in Indigenous elders 65 years or older. And through March and April, we plan to immunize another 400,000 people, building off the successes we had in Phase 1. That means using the same mobile clinics that we were so successful in Phase 1 to make sure that independent living uh, facilities uh, are immunized, as well as not just residents but staff, to meet that target. Dr. Ballum will lay out in some detail in a few moments uh, the overall plan for phase two, but uh, I want to just say before we start the detailed briefing that although there is light at the end of the tunnel, we are far from out of this. We have months to go, and I want British Columbians to take the good news we're hearing today with the joy that it deserves. But we need to remind ourselves, not just today, but next week and next month, that we have a long, long way to go. That means we need to continue to practice uh, the principles that Dr. Henry has put in place over the past number of months, that we remain physically distanced, we keep our groups as small as possible, we don't come to work when we're sick, we wear masks whenever we can inside, in, inside absolutely, and in fact, whenever uh, we are out and about uh, for a walk, for mental health breaks and so on. The challenges that we have all endured over the past 12 months have been profound. But the challenges ahead are equally profound. And although there is fantastic news on the horizon, it depends on supply. And I think most British Columbians know, but I want to repeat it again. We are dependent on offshore supplies of vaccines to meet our targets. The federal government has been working overtime to ensure we get access to those vaccines. But there is no domestic supplier that we can put pressure on. This is a global pandemic. This is a scarce commodity that is in high demand in every corner of the planet. That means that we have to do our level best to focus on staying safe, keeping our families, our communities and our province in a good place as we roll out the plan. Very good news today. Dr. Henry is going to tell us a little bit about that before we turn it to Dr. Ballum and Minister Dix. But again, to all British Columbians, we need to continue what we're doing. We need to stay the course so that we can keep our families, our communities and our province safe. With that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Henry and we'll go from there. Thank you very much and good morning. As you know, throughout this pandemic, um, our goals have been quite clear. Our three main goals have been to do all we can to prevent people from getting seriously ill or dying from COVID-19 to keep our health system fully functioning so that anyone who needs the care that they, they can get the care that they need when they need it. And of course, to minimize as much as we can the disruption to our society, although we know that it has been profound. These goals have guided our decision making on our pandemic response and on our BC immunization program. 
the scientific evidence has proven that the single most important risk factor for becoming seriously ill or dying from COVID-19 is age. The older you are, the more at risk of severe illness or death you are. That is why here in BC, like many uh, jurisdictions around the world, the foundation of our immunization program is an age-based approach to first protect those who are most vulnerable or caring for the most vulnerable in our long-term care, assisted living, and now moving out into the community. We are started, starting with our oldest and most vulnerable and working from there. But we now have some new tools. First, as we heard on Friday, we now have three safe and highly effective vaccines available for use in Canada. The addition of the AstraZeneca and Serum Institute of India viral vector vaccine, uh, which has been used quite a lot in many countries in the world, particularly in the UK, which will be supplied from these two manufacturers, allows us to be more agile in where and how we can immunize people here in BC. Unlike the vaccines that we've had so far from Pfizer, BioNTech and from uh, Moderna, this is a vaccine that is stable at fridge temperatures, so two to eight as we call it in the immunization world. That means we can use our community infrastructure and we can be much more flexible on how we can immunize people. Um, we can use our established distribution systems because no special freezers are needed. Once we know how much we'll be receiving here in BC and when, we will be able to further expand who is receiving vaccine. And our plan has always been to look at a parallel track for some of these fridge stable and more flexible vaccines. And we don't anticipate that the, the supplies that we're going to get in the short term are going to be at the level that we have with the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. We do believe that we will start to target um, essential workers, particularly uh, our, our first responders and our key essential workers who are not able to work from home. And we've had a number of, of places in communities around the province where we've had outbreaks. If we think about things like uh, poultry workers, working people who work in some of our mail distribution centers. So our BC Immunization Committee will be looking at how do we best use the doses that we have uh, coming in. We expect that we'll receive our first shipment sometime next week. Uh, but once we get those details, we'll be working those through and determining who best to target with the initial uh, supplies. So this is exciting news. That means that we will be able to move everybody up in the queue. The, the second exciting news is that we have been monitoring very closely from the very beginning the effectiveness of the vaccines that we have here in BC and particularly on the elder population that we've been immunizing as a priority. And we have uh, expertise at the BC Centre for Disease Control in particular where we, uh, from the very early days, we made sure that every single dose was recorded and we knew who got what vaccine when. And part of this feeds into our evaluation of vaccine effect we have seen that the vaccines we have here in BC are safe and they provide a very high level of real world protection with the initial dose. And some of that data was presented last week from the BC CDC, which showed that the protection that we're getting after a single dose, once your body's immune system responds to that, so at about three weeks, is about 90%, even in long-term care homes, our most frail elderly. This is an amazing news. We also have been working, uh, the team at the BC CDC has been exchanging data with uh, our colleagues across the country and the similar data coming out of Quebec as well as the UK and Israel and other countries around the world. We've also been working with our National Advisory Committee on Immunization, who spent several days this past week looking at this very same question, and I know there will be a statement coming out from NACI in the near future. The important thing that we have learned is that these vaccines work, they give a very high level of protection, and that protection lasts for many months. As a result, we are now extending the interval between our first dose and the second booster dose of the vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine, to four months or 16 weeks. In combination with the new uh, vaccines that we have available, this gives us a very important and very real benefit to everybody here in BC. That means we can move everybody up the list 
and more people will be protected sooner. Extending this second dose provides very high real-world protection to more people sooner. We will also continue to closely monitor. We're going to continue our vaccine evaluation to make sure that we can detect if there's any concerns about um, vaccine effectiveness as we go forward. As, uh, as we know, uh, one of the key areas that we have been following very carefully is long-term care homes and the restrictions that have been in place in long-term care homes we know have had um, very challenging effects for families and for, for residents. So we will be revisiting when we can re decrease those restrictions given what we know now about how effective these vaccines are and we'll have more information about that very soon. I know everyone is eager to get their vaccine as soon as possible and that is great news as well. As we have seen that as more people are taking the vaccine and we're showing it's safe, more people are coming on board and recognizing that it will not only protect them but their community as well. And many, many people in uh, public health, in our healthcare system and communities, we're working across the board um, to, to make sure that we are able to provide immunizations as effectively and quickly as we can. And Dr. Ballum will be talking about that now. I want to thank everybody for their patience and enthusiasm. We have a great deal of confidence in these vaccines, that they are safe, they are and effective, and I encourage that people in BC do as well. I'll now hand things over to Dr. Ballum to speak about the specific logistical uh, challenges and uh, details of the next phase. Thanks very much, Dr. Henry and uh, Premier Horgan. It's a pleasure to be back here today to just report back on a short summary of the progress that we've made in phase one and then just provide some really detailed information for our public around uh, what's ahead of us in uh, these exciting next weeks of March and into early April. Um, you, the, this slide basically just talks about our commitment that was made um, in January. You know, we have committed to immunize our full population by the end of September. And our, our approach was divided into four phases. We're now entering phase two. Um, both phase one and phase two are focused on priority populations, which I'll describe to you. And in phase three, we, we move into the broader general population where we will be approaching it using age-based groups. Next slide. As Dr. Henry has said, we've had three goals um, to date since our vaccines first arrived in December. Protect the most vulnerable, assisted living and long-term care residents and the staff who look after them, remote and isolated First Nations communities, and then protect our health system, both for people with COVID, but also for people with other health problems and maintain our surgical program. Just keep our system running to do the job it's here to do. Finally, vaccines are a, a remarkable tool to help control refractory outbreaks. And we have used those around the province to do that very successfully. So moving on to the next slide, um, our our COVID, um, oops, I think we got ahead. We got ahead. Bonnie, uh, maybe you could just back up a bit to slide five. Yeah. yeah. So um, this, the, the next slide, if you could just go back a couple of, oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry, no worries. So this is a, a graphic that uh, I think everyone's familiar with. It, it shows our four phases and the populations in phase one and two that we are working on. You can see that in phase one, residents and staff, central visitors of long-term care, many isolated First Nations communities are, are, we have made very good progress. We've been vaccinating healthcare workers first and foremost in the hospitals. And as we move into phase two, we will continue the work on those vulnerable populations. We will be branching out to congregate settings like independent living, where we have a lot of frail seniors living. Um, we will continue on our community and, and you know, our broader hospital staff. Um, you know, areas such as uh, group homes and um, correctional facilities where people really don't have the ability to protect themselves. And finally, uh, in the last two weeks, as I'll describe, we're going to turn our attention to our first general population group, those over 80, where we will be bringing them back in for vaccination starting the middle of March. 
and also our Indigenous peoples who are over the age of 65. Phase three and phase four, we're going to come back to you. They remain our broad population groups by age. And I think given the news that Dr. Henry um, told you about just now, that is going to change for the good. Um, those groups, we know they will move up. We will reach more of our population much more quickly with the extension of second doses and uh, the, the other vaccines that are now getting approved and are going to become available. This next slide is, is a remarkable slide because it basically speaks to the fact that as vaccine has come in, and that is the pink line, um, that, that's vaccine, I, I, you can see that I've got my labels crossed over, but vaccine supply is pink, and the vaccine that we have utilized got into people's arms is purpley blue. And what you can see is there's a very, very tight relationship with those two lines, and what that means is as vaccine has come in, we've used it, and we've been vaccinating those priority populations. And I'll show you a little bit of data in a minute what, what, what that results that has provided us. You can see right at the end of February, we, we have more vaccine. It arrived a bit later in the week than we, than we had anticipated, but that vaccination, we are, we are poised and ready to deal with the, the remarkable increased supply of vaccine. And we will continue to keep those two lines very closely associated. On our next slide, you, you can see that um, we, we have strong vaccine efficacy, as Dr. Henry has referred to. It has um, these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, just with one dose, are extraordinarily effective and have really reduced the incidence of outbreaks in our long-term care and assisted living sector. It has reduced the incidence of outbreaks in our acute care sector. And, you know, as, as we've learned, that this evidence that is both local and international um, is, is allowing us to make decisions about extending the distance between dose one and dose two. What that does is free up more vaccine for our population. I'm just going to show you a, a couple of data slides, um, if we can advance the slide, just to show you just how remarkable the impact of this, these vaccines have been. So the first one relates to long-term care residents. And on the left-hand axis, the vertical axis, it's the number of cases after vaccination. And on the bottom line, it's, it's the number of days after someone has got vaccinated. And when we looked at all the residents of long-term care that had been vaccinated and then tracked all, all the new cases that flowed after those initial dose one vaccinations, what you can see is for the first two to three weeks, we continued to get some cases which started to fall off midway midway into the third week and then after three weeks it drops down to one case here one case there and then to nothing and that is absolutely our experience and just such really such a miracle for us in that sector to have finally been able to protect those residents and in the next slide a very very similar pattern for our healthcare workers those healthcare workers it's you can see the same pattern if you look at their experience in the two to three weeks after they've been vaccinated, the, the new cases amongst them falls right down. And after three weeks, it, it basically drifts off to, to zero. And, and that too has allowed us to protect our healthcare system, um, both in the long-term care sector and in acute care. And as we move our vaccinations to those who work in the community, we will see the same impact. So in summary, from the 13th of December, when the first vaccinations rolled into British Columbia, all the way to the end of February, we, we, have, we have basically dramatically reduced outbreaks and infections in assisted living long-term care amongst the staff and the residents. Um, we've stabilized and diminished and closed down the outbreaks in our acute care sector. And uh, you know, you will recognize a number of hospitals you've heard about were impacted by that. And we have reduced other outbreaks that are in our communities and First Nations communities and, and other settings where we actually have brought outbreaks to a close that have persisted and not, not responded in the way we would like to our foundational public health measures. So I'm going to move on now to what's ahead of us in phase two. And I think the, the, the next slide shows that we, our intention is, as the Premier indicated, is to, to vaccinate another 400,000 um, British Columbians in March and early April. And I think we can anticipate that number will go up because with a decision to extend the dose two 
time frame, we, we know right away we will free up another 70,000 doses and then uh, to, to achieve dose one, so to expand the coverage in our population. And in, uh, in terms of the, the new vaccine AstraZeneca that will be arriving, we don't exactly know how much we'll be getting, but that too will allow us to, to actually increase that number. So this, these next couple of slides really deal with vaccine supply and we're very confident in the, in the coming weeks in March that the vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna that have been committed to us are, are going to arrive. The Moderna arrives a little bit uh, into the mid and late part of March. Pfizer is on a weekly basis and, and although we have had issues in the, in the past weeks, um, now the, the flow is starting to significantly increase and we anticipate that we will be getting those. Occasionally to one or another health authority where the, the travel is more complicated, uh, these things do get delayed and we're, we're learning to accommodate and anticipate those things. But generally we, we have a lot of confidence. The populations that we'll be addressing, as I said, um, we've got priority populations that remain to be finished off from phase one and phase two, about 190,000. Uh, we've got remote and isolated indigenous communities we have to finish off and some communities with clusters. Um, we will then turn our attention to people born before 1941 or on uh, in that year and those are the 80 plus, that's our first population group and along with them, are 65 plus Indigenous peoples who will be coming in to get vaccinated. You can see there's a very good match between the pretty solidly uh, anticipated supply of Moderna and Pfizer and the, and the remaining population that we want to vaccinate. This next slide basically covers uh, ground that Dr. Henry has talked about today, so I'm really not going to go into it. But as, essentially, as I said, uh, we, we will have about 70,000 extra dose ones to actually expand the spread for our population. Um, <coughs> very much appreciated and there will be another 40,000 that will be coming back to you in the coming days to say these are extra dose ones that we have available to us and here's how we're going to deploy them to expand the protection of our public. Um, Dr. Dr. Henry has already addressed uh, the issues of AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson, we we expect that we'll get about a 660,000 doses of AstraZeneca in March. Um, we expect it to arrive at the end of the first week in March. We're not exactly sure uh, the exact amount, but that's the range. And as Dr. Henry said, she will be coming back to to our public um, with you know how we're going to utilize that in the most strategic way to advance the management of our pandemic and and protect our population. And as she said, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been approved by the FDA in the United States. It's being studied by Health Canada. Um, it's another possibility about which we, we don't have much information about the volumes that will be available to us and when those will be coming. So future news for, um, for a future day. So I, I want to return back then to the more detailed plans for phase two, um, and particularly those that address our population-based groups of seniors over 80 and First Nations uh, Indigenous peoples over 65. So um, this slide, uh, this next slide basically talks about the phase two timeline. And we basically divided March up into two tranches, the first March 1st to 15th. And that we will continue, as I said, with the remainder of our phase one and, and our phase two priority population groups high-risk individuals in congregate settings, in shelters, in correctional facilities, um, in group homes who are quite vulnerable. Continue on uh, with our healthcare workers, our high-risk seniors living in independent living, both them and the staff that look after them, high-risk seniors in supportive housing, and long-term home support clients who are living in their own homes, um, often with family, but are receiving regular support um, to help them manage uh, in their frailty. And moving on to, you know, our, our next slide, really now our first age-based population cohort, over 80, and Indigenous people over 65. This is the first age cohort of the general public to be vaccinated. It's very exciting. It's the start of our age-based uh, vaccination program. And what we have done, because these are, these are our elders in our community, both Indigenous and in the general population, some of them are quite frail, some of them are very vigorous, 
And we, we've set up a system here for the last two weeks of April, first week of April, uh, sorry, last two weeks of March and the first week of April to actually bring them into clinics that are pretty familiar to them uh, based on when they get vaccinated for the flu. So community-based clinics that the health authorities will be setting up. We will have them call in and, and make an appointment to come into those clinics. And th those call centers to receive those calls will start on March 8th. Every health authority will have a call center with a unique number. The appointments can be made for the available clinics in, their, in these communities. And we will, in order to manage the, the volume, because there's about 175,000 um, of our public who are over the age of 80 who are, are going to be enthusiastically responding to the, the opportunity to get vaccine. And we know their families have been fussing about them and wanting to get them in and get them protected because they know, as Dr. Henry has told us, that they're the most vulnerable. So we are going to divide our over 80 population into subgroups uh, based on their year of birth and you know their corresponding age in order to not overwhelm our call centers um, right off the bat because we've seen that happen and and you know we we can protect to a certain amount against that and we know our public is going to want to cooperate so that we can get our our elders in the community vaccinated and there are some communities where they're so small that they will be vaccinated in, in total and and i can give you information about that um, later, and it will be on the Health Authority websites. But basically, on the next slide, you can see the construct of how we're going to call, um, have people call in. So we'll divide it up into three segments. The first one, starting the ability to call in and make an appointment for a vaccine, will be those over 90. And it will be by year of birth, so they are born in or before 1931. The next group um, will call in starting March 15th. And their vaccinations will start March 22nd. So you see it will be a week and a week for the call and then the vaccination. So for those over 85, their year of birth is in or before 1936. And finally, the, the group over 80, which is our largest group, they can start calling March 22nd to their local health authority call center. Their vaccinations will start March 29th and their year of birth will be in or before 1941. For our Indigenous people, they can call in starting the first week and we will vaccinate them um, throughout the, the, the full time period. People should only call in when they're eligible. We really encourage uh, our media colleagues and our MLAs, our communities, family members to actually help people understand why this is so important so that our ability to respond and book people in these age segments um, isn't interfered with by just the technical overwhelm of, of call centers by so many people all calling in at once. But reassure them that everybody's gonna get vaccinated. We will reach everyone. If they miss their eligible call date, it's no problem. Once they're eligible, they can call any time after that. And we, we want everyone to understand that they don't have to rush to be the first caller. They will get their vaccine. They will get it in their community and it will be um, you know, a remarkable event. So just moving on for a little bit more detail, because many people over their 80s might need some help with calling in, uh, we, we're gonna make it very easy for that if they have a family member, support person, a friend who can actually help them uh, call into the call center or even use their mobile device or their email to, to get the confirmation um, that they're, they're over 80, elder or senior is, is actually booked for a vaccination, we were encouraging people to get help if they need it and not to feel that they have to, you know, navigate this system all on their own. We also have the, the government BC Seniors First website that is, will have lots of information along with the health authority websites about where and how you go through the steps to get yourself an appointment and get in to get vaccinated. And just a thing to remember, because we have had some instances of phishing already, um, health authority call centers will never ask for your social insurance number, your driver's license, any banking information, your credit card, that will not happen. And if our seniors find themselves on a phone call where people are asking them that, they're on the wrong phone call. And then they're on the wrong number and they need to get off the call and, and find out the right number to call because that will not happen. Um, on the next slide, this is just a bit of information for our public about what, what can they expect the information they will need. They will need their first and last name. 
they will be um, providing their date of birth and if they're ineligible for that week they will be nicely told that they have to wait till the next week we will need their postal code so we can map them to their health authority um, and to um, you know other information that will be important their personal health number and many people may not know what their personal health number is it's the thing that's on the back of their either their driver's license their their BC services card or many people still carry around their care card um, that you can see in this in this slide and that is that's all the personal health number and that's a very important number for them to have ready for us and then contact information either their own as a senior or the the contact information for their support person and they will get their appointment confirmed both on the telephone and then um, by email or text so let's let's just walk mrs mcwinney from richmond who's 86 year old years old through her uh, her, her process so Mrs. McGuinney's going to hear on the radio, on the TV, she might see, she might have her daughter call her, her friends, her church group, her social support network, her seniors network might say, oh, it's time for you to get your vaccine, you're eligible now. And she will, she can learn of the steps to get that vaccine through her support network by going on the government website, by going on her own health authority website, which will lay it all out very clearly. We will be running ads in the paper. Um, and on, on the internet. Like we are trying to get a multi-channel approach out. Also through civil society organizations who, who work with seniors and, and with people in the immigrant and refugee community. So we've touched base with all of them and they will get this information. So it's through our whole community that our seniors will learn that they're eligible now for vaccination and also help explain the, the, the year of birth segmenting that will we do to protect our call centers. So Mrs. McWinney can call the Vancouver Coastal Health Call Center on her week of eligibility, which will be after March 15th because she's 86, born on or her year of birth was 1934. She'll talk to an agent, schedule an appointment, book a location, and then she'll receive confirmation by email or, or text. And either that will go to her own email or text or her mobile phone, or that that she's provided of a friend or support or a family member and she will get vaccinated the week of March 22nd. So what if Mrs. McWinney calls and it isn't her week or her um, by age to call? And if that happens, we, she will very nicely be asked to call back during the week that she is eligible and, um, and book any time after that. And what if the call center queue is too long for her? We will have a queue that is a reasonable length of time and after that we will ask people to call back later when the, when the loads have come off. And we know that these are things that happen. Uh, every jurisdiction we've talked to has experienced these issues in the early days of opening up to the broad public. And it's just something that we, we hope everybody will help us manage through the segmenting of age and also just encouraging people just to call when they're, they're, it's clearly their week to be eligible. And if Mrs. McWinney's daughter or neighbor is calling on her behalf, no problem. The booking will be made, um, the contact information will be clarified, and you know. And then if Mrs. McWinney has questions about her vaccine, about the safety, or other um, COVID issues, there is the COVID line she will be able to call and ask her family doctor who is well informed, and also go on the, the health authority, the BCCDC website, and the government website. So this next slide is really a social media graphic that we will be using just to clarify these dates so everyone understands when it's their time to call and when they'll get their vaccination. So I'm not gonna walk you through that again. I'm just gonna quickly talk about phase three and phase four, which as we look ahead to the rest of our population, um, we know it's gonna change. So just right up front, um, we, we've just had this news of AstraZeneca at the very end of the week. Not quite sure the exact volumes. Um, and then, as Dr. Henry said, the extension of dose two will make a big, big difference to our ability to vaccinate our mass population. It will effectively, when we modeled it last night, it, it will likely result in by, by mid to late July that we will have been able to give a first dose to everybody in our population, which is a significant shift from our our earlier plan out into September. So we will be coming back with the details on that. So it's very, very good news. Very good news for returning to uh, life as, 
as usual, but as the Premier says, in the meantime, we, we have to still pay close attention to our public health guidelines. But phase three will begin in mid-April, and, and the one thing that, that will be a, a major transformation is that we will have a provincial digital platform at that time. There will be a very robust online registration and booking system. We will have a call, a provincial call centre, one number, that will actually uh, allow people to get help from a call centre if they require it. But as we move down in, uh, in the age groups, we know more and more people will want to book themselves online. They're very used to that. And that in and of itself is, is a major, major step forward for our whole vaccination program, not just for COVID, but for all vaccines in British Columbia. And, and to Dr. Henry's point, our ability to track every vaccine that's given, who it went to, where they live, how old they were. And in the case of these last uh, two, the, these first two phases, what priority group they were in. It has allowed us to track, you know, real time vaccine effectiveness, where we have gaps in, in reach and to readjust and, and you know, re, uh, reconfigure our approach. So really this will be a, a big step and we'll be coming back to talk to you about all that in the near future. So in summary, we plan to vaccinate 400,000 people in BC or more in March and the very early part of April. Um, the first two weeks in March, we'll be reaching out through the health authorities to reach people in, in different settings um, and, you know, finishing off our priority populations to the greatest extent possible. And from March 15th on, our first age-based population group will be coming into our vaccine clinics our seniors that we've all been waiting and anticipating their, their ability to get protected by these really incredible vaccines. So I really appreciate your time today and um, I'm gonna stop there and, and uh, I think uh, take any questions for uh, any of us here at the podium. Thank you very Great. much.